Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you that haven't done so yet, or if you are new, tuning in to Back to Ashes and you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to hit that little subscribe button down below and ring that bell and set it to all. That way it will remind you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Kidnap Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll play the first story. An ad will play, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. All right, so this is my very short but yet creepy story. I live in a town in Canada with a population of 36,000. The town that I live in is known for the strange and extremely creepy people that roamed the street both day and night. When I was 10 years old, it was on a summer night at around 8 p.m. While the sun was still going down, I was outside the front of my house by myself, riding my skateboard. I was about to get going inside before it got too dark when I noticed someone out of place. Across the street, I see an old beige minivan with very tinted windows. I noticed some part of light or flash from the driver's side window, almost as if he was taking a picture. Before I knew it, an old lady opens the door of the van and starts walking extremely fast towards me. It was happening so fast that I didn't even get a good look at her. As soon as she was walking fast towards me, I grabbed my skateboard and ran inside, locking the door behind me. Once I was inside, I ran to my bedroom at the front of the house. To my dismay, the van was gone. I've never told anyone about this encounter because I always thought I was overthinking it. I never knew what that lady's true intentions were, and honestly, I don't want to. Okay, so back when I was 17, something really scary happened. I used to think I was overreacting, but looking back on it, it was actually pretty terrifying. In the span of one week, I had three different instances where I believe I was being targeted for abduction or something of that sort. It all started at the mall. My parents were out of town for a week, so I was hanging out with a friend. We were sitting outside of the mall and I was smoking a cigarette when this white car pulled up and rolled the windows down. They seemed kind of sketched to begin with. They were four or three of them, I can't quite remember, but they all had on the same sunglasses and seemed to be in their early 30s, maybe late 20s. Maybe. They looked to be Latino. One of the guys asked me for a cigarette. I was always pretty generous with those, but I did hesitate a little while I walked up to their car. Something just seemed off about them to me. They began explaining they aren't from this part of town and they wanted some locals to show them a good time. The guy that asked me for a cigarette never even lit it and then kind of made it seem like he didn't even smoke. They asked if we wanted to party with them. We politely rejected their offer, but I still won't forget how the one in the passenger seat said, we don't take no for an answer. They drove away slowly after he said that. I asked my friend if she was as weirded out by them as I was, but she actually said she thought they were just being friendly. I kind of shrugged it off after that, not thinking much more of it. The next day, I was at home pretty much all day, just chilling alone. I was blasting loud music in the house since my parents would be gone on a trip all week. Later that evening, when I went to get the mail though, my neighbor walks over to me, which was weird since they rarely speak to me. 
She asked me if I was okay. I was kind of confused. <laughs> of course, I'm fine. Should I not be? Is basically what I said. She went on to explain that earlier she came outside to walk her dog and saw a suspicious looking man in my yard and an unfamiliar white car parked out front. She said the man was looking in the window of my house and also looked in my car. Once he noticed her looking at him, though, he took off. She asked if he knocked, but I wouldn't have heard it because of the music. I was pretty scared after that. I called my parents to tell them everything, even the mall incident, but they didn't really believe me, I guess. They thought I was being paranoid and just told me to lock the doors and go to the neighbors if I was that scared. They said it could have been my cousin who stopped by, but I asked him and told me he hadn't been by the house yet. Later that night, a pretty nasty storm hit and the power went out. I was not about to stay in a dark-ass house alone after all that weird stuff going on, so I called a good friend and asked if I could stay with her family until my parents came home for the rest of the week. They believed me and were really concerned too. They let me stay and even gave me pepper spray. I had one final encounter a few days after that. I was in a Walmart parking lot after buying a few things. I was just sitting in my car, responding to texts and finding music to listen to when a guy parks a white car next to mine and comes and taps on my window. I was pretty weirded out, so I only rolled down my window just enough to speak to him. He gave me a similar talk as the ones at the mall did, but a bit creepier. He said he wasn't from around town and needed directions to Starbucks. You could literally see Starbucks from the parking lot we were in, so I just pointed to it. But for some reason, he asked me again. I started to roll up my window, but he tried making small talk, and since he was kind of creepy, I didn't want to be rude. He told me he liked to party and asked if I did also. I'm not really religious, but him asking me this in the same way the guys from the mall did was just petrifying, so I had replied, nope, no partying here, just reading my Bible. Then he went on about how I was really beautiful. I tried to roll the window up and end the conversation there, but he put his fingers in the window, which scared me, so I stopped. He told me I look like Shakira and asked if he could take a picture of me. That's super sketch, right? I told him no, I'd prefer not. Then he asked if he could be in the picture with me. And I was like, dude, no, I gotta go. Successfully rolling up the window this time, I bolted out of that parking lot. However, I did notice after I left the same kind of white car he was driving was following me now. I was driving a pretty far distance too. I had to go to the mall to give my sister's husband a ride home from work. I like to take back roads and this white car followed me all through the back roads. He followed me all the way to the mall. I got stopped at a railroad and it was getting pretty dark. It was just me and that white car. I thought he was going to get out of his car and try to snatch me. I had my pepper spray ready and my phone also ready to dial 911. I was in tears. I'm so glad the car left once I got to the mall. I have no real evidence that the car following me was him, but I still found it pretty strange that a car followed me through every route I took. I haven't had any encounters since then. I have no idea why all of that happened. I just know it was absolutely terrifying. In 2007, I was eight years old and my family decided to go to Egypt for our yearly holiday lasting two weeks. 
My family is small, only consisting of myself, my mom, and my dad. My family were drawn to the beautiful history and the Red Sea surrounding Egypt because both of my parents loved diving on their holidays. My appearance, I had golden blonde hair that went almost white in the sun, pale skin and big bright blue eyes. I was also a little chunky. The first day was pretty normal from my recollection and my parents'. We all went upstairs and took a nap. During the evening, we went to the hotel's restaurant located inside the hotel complex. Here, we met a boy my age and his single mother. They had been here a week. I got on really well with this boy, and I spent most of my evening chatting to him and playing close by to where our parents were. When it came time to leave, I remember hearing my parents talking about how concerned they were for that lady and her son, etc. But they wouldn't tell me at the time. About a week and a half passed and I'd made more friends at this hotel. I was a very sociable child and would make friends with almost anyone at that age. I remember myself and a group of other kids wanting to go and swim in the other bigger pool. We asked our parents, and they all said yes, and a few adults joined us by this other pool on the opposite side of the hotel. My parents didn't come, as there was kids' club people watching over us, as well as the other adults. My parents weren't there, as they'd both gone on a diving trip a couple of hours after I had asked them to go to this pool. They were fine with me being here, as there were trusted adult supervision. My parents were not in any way bad for this, as in that kids club, they would take you all over the hotel and the beach during the day times, and this wasn't any different. I remember needing the toilet, and I wasn't going to pee in this pool. I got out using the steps, and for some reason, indistinctively, looked to my right and saw a greasy, ugly man just standing there smirking with a grin on his face which I recognize to this day as being a leering expression, holding his phone up right at me. I looked at him and noticed he was in a security guard uniform, standing by the gates to the other half of the hotel. The toilets were just inside those gates. I remember trying to walk past him and him telling me to smile. Come on, give me a smile. I ran back to the adults, but didn't tell them. Later that evening at dinner, my parents could tell I was being off and asked me to tell them what was wrong, believing I have had a falling out with the other kids or something. When I told them about the security guard and what he had done, my dad got straight up from that table, nearly knocking our food everywhere, and stormed straight to the manager's office, and I was left with my mom. Around an hour later, he came back and said how the manager would pull the security guard into the office the next morning, especially when a shift started, and they would go through his phone. I don't know how legal that is, but God, I'm thankful. The manager did just that. The security guard was taking in the next morning, and there was so many pictures taken of me from not just the day I caught him, but from day one, the day I got here, multiple pictures a day from when I woke up to have my swim to lunch to when I was at dinner with my family, most of which I was soaking wet from the pool and in a bathing suit. Some of these images had been sent to men on his phone's text messages. The manager promptly fired him and tried his best to apologize by giving us a fruit basket. Yeah, okay. Oh, and remember that woman and her son I heard my parents talking about? Well, she had been having similar issues, but instead of pictures, she had been getting calls to her hotel room phone from a man saying how hot she was, that he knew what room she was in, and that he was going to sexually assault her. That's when my parents and I spent every day and evening with her and her son until they left for the airport. 
That man was arrested a couple days after she reported it to the hotel, and he tried to attack her when he saw her. So any threat my parents thought was in that hotel was now gone. On this same holiday, my family went to this little knick-knack shop just outside the hotel for souvenirs. The shop owner there tried to tickle me and put me on his lap, even after my mom told him to leave me alone and that we were leaving. He said, can I have a kiss? And touched his lips. I was hiding behind my mom at this point. She walked out with me. We told my dad, who was outside having a cigarette, what happened. And let's just say we heard a few choice words from inside and the shop owner apologizing over and over. So, you creepy, nasty man. I hope you never got the chance to creep on another small child ever again. Alrighty, dear listeners, buckle your seatbelt. This next story is really long. Here we go. I have been clean from all drugs since 2019. It took me a while to write this. I never thought I would be posting because of how stupid I was and the stupid mistakes I made. I know I will get a lot of duh comments on here, so just don't even say it. I already know. I am telling the story to remind people that everyone's intentions are not what they say they are. I am mentally traumatized from this experience, and I get reminders of it daily. I am grateful to be alive, and I have no idea what would have happened if I didn't get away when I did. So, save the rude and cruel comments. Thank you. This story is based in September 2017, I believe. Such a fucking blur. I did whatever I could to survive in this harsh world. So please, no judgment. I was on the streets, no family, and an active crackhead, soon to become addicted to meth. Backstory. I started using crack in 2015, and I figured out that if I sold my body, I could easily make the money. I know not ideal, but I was deep into my addiction, and at that point, I didn't care about anything. But in January of 2017, I met a guy named Ty who was also smoking crack, but worked every day so I no longer had to do that. I was going on like eight months free from selling my body and soul. Also, when I met Ty, he had a place in his big city and he did a lot of work for people within the city. I was left on the street by the man I thought I had loved at the time. I must have said something wrong because he flipped out and left with everything I owned in his truck. Fuck, we just spent days getting high and I was sure he was just throwing a fit, so I went over to my friend. Let's call him E. E's house. It was my home away from home, and I felt safe there. E was an older, maybe 60-year-old man who liked to get high, and over time, he became one of the best friends I've ever had. I was able to take a shower and put on clean clothes. When I was all done, I remember sitting on the couch with disbelief that Ty would leave me like that. I started crying and wishing things had been different while E held me and comforted me. I knew deep down that I needed a fresh start to depend on myself and live a happy life. Across the street from E's house was a hometown bar with rappers and musicians who would perform and on that particular night, the bar had been filled with people from the bigger city about a half an hour away. Let me explain. Where I come from, there isn't really a place for addicts to go and get clean. They do have a women's shelter, which I had been to before. About 30 minutes away is a bigger city where they have all the help you can ask for, if you are willing to do the work. 
At this point, I was ready to get away from everyone and everything. I had no hope of cleaning up my life if I stayed anywhere close to where I was using. Remember, you have to remove old playmates, play things and play grounds. So that's what I needed to do. I went right over to that bar and found a semi good looking guy heading back to the city. I needed to go. I told him I had planned to go to the shelter in the morning, and he told me I could just go with him and he will take me in the morning. On the ride, I remember feeling a whole 100 bricks was lifted off of my shoulders. I had nothing but the clothes on my back and a Obama phone with no minutes. I asked the guy I was with that was driving, had a pretty sweet ride by the way, I said, you don't fuck with this, right? And I pulled out my crack pipe. He shook his head so I rolled down the window and just let it go. I knew that going into the shelter, I had to get better. And not just for me, but I had kids and a family that at the time still hoped I would get better. I wanted to start over. I just didn't know how hard it was going to be. Me and this random dude go to his friend's house. We smoke a blunt, and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up on the floor of a clean room, and I mean clean. There was nothing in it. It smelt like paint. As I looked around, I realized this was the place the dude was talking about moving into and renting. I got up, and he took me to get a coffee and right over to the shelter. I was fucking terrified of what I was walking into. I had no idea what to expect. All I knew was I needed to better my life and I needed to do it now. As we drove into downtown, I got a little nervous because I knew downtown was full of crime and drug dealers. Big buildings and confusing signs, tons of people in traffic. I then realized I was going to have to work really hard to get my life back. We pulled onto the street and before I knew it, he was dropping me off. There I was, standing in this big, beautiful, clean lobby, just feeling lost and broken. I had been with Ty for almost seven months, and this was the first time he left me like this. So I was kind of hurt over that. I knew he had been seeing someone else on our recent month breakup, and he wasn't afraid to show it. It smelled like lime with spotless white walls. I walked up to the desk and I was asked if I was homeless. Yes, I said, and she didn't even ask any questions. She just looked at me with sad eyes and said, Okay, hun, let's get you set up. She took me to a small room full of boxes as she handed me one. She explained it was for my personal things, toiletries, etc., I looked at her with unsettling eyes and replied that I didn't have any belongings, that I had lost everything the night before. The nice lady gave me some toiletries and a pair of leggings. Next was the intake, where I had to answer a bunch of questions and was handed a paper with all the rules on it. And on the top of the paper, it stated there was no Wi-Fi in or around the building. You had to go down to the stop sign to get internet. My phone wasn't off, but I could still use Wi-Fi. But at that time, I wasn't really that worried about it. I knew Ty was already probably staying with yet another girl. Michelle was her name. So I didn't feel it was necessary to even try to use my phone. I decided to cut it off and try to be different. When she was giving me the rundown on how things work, she took me into the day room. Walking from the lobby was weird, and I remember feeling sick going through the double doors with stairs right off to the left. Under the stairs was a pile of mats. I was told to grab one. I followed her through another set of double doors into the day room, which was huge. It was filled with at least 50 females, a lot of other ladies with nowhere to go, but it was loud and bright. The wall to my left was full of lockers, which I was told I would get one if I stayed there long enough. And in front of that wall, maybe around 10 to 15 round tables set up. 
where most of the girls were sitting, playing cards, coloring, and talking. On the other side of the room was the shower and bathroom, and a small TV that sat on a cart with wheels. On it, next to the cart, was a end table that had an electrical strip full of chargers and phones. In the far back right corner was the door that led outside to go smoke. It was nice. There was picnic tables and lawn chairs set up with a huge fenced-in yard for the kids to play in. When 7 p.m. hit, the whole dynamic of the room changed. Everyone was moving around. People was running in and then you'd hear it over the speaker. Roll call. Then we were instructed to go and get one mat to sleep on. They passed out blankets and pillows to those who were without. And they let us keep the TV on. The first night was scary and lonely. Here I was in a strange place, not even two full days clean, off of a week-long crack binge. I was up half of the night with my head just racing. I finally fell asleep when the other girls started to get quiet. The morning came way too fast, and the rule was you had to get up by 7 a.m. You didn't have to leave, but you had to get up. A lot of the older ladies didn't even leave the shelter. They knew they had a place to stay and had nothing else to do all day, so they hung out together at the shelter all day long. I had to go upstairs for breakfast, which was okay. I'm not really a breakfast food person, but that morning I was starving. I had the whole deal, eggs, bacon, milk. After breakfast, I went out to smoke and I noticed this tiny black girl with corn rolls in her hair had some cards in her back pocket. I had been playing cards since I was a kid. My dad taught me a few games. I played with friends and I also had done some time in jail in the past. I was lonely. I didn't know where anything was and it was obvious I needed help. I asked her her name and if she wanted to play cards. And after two games, we had a connection. She was cool and she liked me, so I was okay with that. I can be awkward around new people, and females tend to not like me, so I find it hard sometimes to make friends. She asked me after we played a few more games of Rummy if I wanted to go to McDonald's with her. I was cool with that because I needed to learn the area anyway. On the walk there, as we were talking, something caught my eye. So I looked up, and there he fucking was. Ty, with all of my belongings in his truck, driving right by us. I tried to call, but he ignored me every time. Guess he was done with me for good this time. That crushed me. I wanted to fall to the ground and just sink until I disappeared, but instead, I had about 10 different emotions running through my body all at once. I was so angry that he was just looking for a reason to leave me since the month before when we broke up and I stayed with my dad for a while. He started seeing this Michelle. I was absolutely devastated. We continued our walk to McDonald's as I was silent and broken. That night was easier to sleep because I was exhausted from not having any sleep and just feeling done. I slept like a baby, to be honest. The next day, Mish wanted to show me this place she goes to to get a good free lunch. The only thing was, it was a church and we had to sit through a 30-minute sermon which was cool with me. We were standing outside waiting on the church to open their doors, and this blacked-out Mercedes Benz with a trailer hauling a badass Harley pulled up and parked in front of the church. I then heard my loud mouth say, Damn, that's a nice fucking setup. I looked at Mish and then looked back at the Harley. That's when I saw him. I specifically remember everyone knowing who he was. Will is what they call him. I remember getting excited to meet new people and be a part of a new community. Everyone was really nice going into the church. A guy at the door 
Walking in gave us a pamphlet of mealtime and services offered. I followed Mish to one of the back pews and slid in behind her. The church was pretty, different colors, and there was a choir singing in a low and almost quiet tone as people around us took their seats. I kind of froze when that guy I saw came in. Will sat down right next to me. I looked at Mish, and then I quickly noticed his gold watch. It could have been fake, but it almost looked like a Rolex. He was an older black gentleman, talked real smooth when he introduced himself with his hand out. I was shocked that he wanted to shake my hand. No one in my life does that. I shook his hand, and they were creamy, like he takes very good care of them and obviously does not work a physically demanding job. He was nicely dressed and had this pimp hat on like a fedora. It even had a feather in it. His cologne was strong but smelled good, just like a man. He was handsome and smooth. He was also very confident. Sitting through this sermon, I found it hard to pay attention to the preacher. I remember looking at his clean, shiny black leather shoes, and the socks were black and thick. When the service was finally over, people started heading into the dining area. I just followed Mish through and we got our food. She picked an empty space to eat on, one of the end of the long tables, full of chairs. Not even five minutes, not paying attention to our surroundings, just eating, Will came over and sat three seats away from me. He looked at Mish and said, Do you mind? I don't know why I didn't see the red flags. Of course, I see them now, but looking back, I was so clueless. He hardly said a word the whole time we were eating, and when he was done, he got up, threw his stuff away, and I assumed he left. Mish and I decide to go home, play some cards, and go to a clothes bank she knew about. We were walking home and talking when he pulled up next to us. He rolled down his window and he asked if we needed a ride home, but he was looking at me with a deep stare. I looked back at Mish and she refused. Smart girl. And I went with him. Dumb girl. I think I was more curious than anything. I had to know how he made that kind of money, and I remember wanting that. We drove around till my curfew and just talked. I don't know what it was. I think he had a lot in common, and we related a lot. He asked me how I ended up at this shelter and just asking questions, so I told him. I don't know what it was. I'm not sure if I trusted him, but I told him about my past anyway how I sold my body for drugs, and how horrible it was, and I even said I was glad I'm not doing those anymore. He didn't say much about it, and we agreed that he would continue our talk the next day, and he would help me put in a couple of applications, and he had some errands too. I woke up in the morning to a text from Will that said, What if you made that kind of money but spent it on yourself? not drugs. Everything you make will go to you building your life. Just think about it. I thought about it. I'm not going to say why I agreed and went with this idea that this would work and I could actually get my life together and get my kids back. $200 a half hour. I could be free. I chose to go with him. At this time, I think he thought I wanted to be with him, but really, I just wanted a way out of this situation I was in. I hated that stinky, loud shelter. I wanted out. He got a rook at a motel, and we dropped off my stuff, and he told me that I needed some new clothes. He did tell me that he was just fired from a trucking company. So, he was a truck driver. He was currently trying to find another job as far as I knew. He took me shopping and got me a few new outfits, more or less outfits to take pictures in, to bring in that kind of money. 
I knew what I was getting into, and I was preparing my mind to handle everything that was about to happen. Will did tell me that if I went with him, I had to stay clean and have a clear mind to make money and be smart. Looking back at how manipulative he was, he made me believe that I would do this to make my life better. I started doing this before I got addicted, a few times to make rent or bills, so I knew I could mentally do it, but I was still unsure where this was going to go. We got back to the hotel and I do my thing, take my pictures and post them. It didn't take long before I started to get calls. I did make some money and I kept every penny and Will took me shopping. I remember the shoes I bought. They were black and gold baby fats. Oh, I loved those shoes. I got like six or seven cute outfits, some makeup and hair dye as well. Remember, I came to the shelter with nothing, so being able to get all of this stuff made me feel so good. I was confident in myself and hopefully that I could get a place and start my own new life within a few weeks if days like that repeated itself. Remembering how things went, I am starting to think that that was a part of his game. Many girls think they can do it and keep all the money and then just trap them and make them need you. It's sick. He tricked me. He made me think I could finally live a clean life. Yeah, I was escorting, but I treated it like a job. I bought another phone so I had a new number and used the Obama phone for work and turned it off at like 5 p.m. I thought wrong. I later that day went back over to the shelter and grabbed the one shirt I had and some personal things, and I left with Will. That night was cool. He was super chill. We talked in separate beds, and we got a two-bed, and he didn't act like he had interest in me like that, which I was happy, because I didn't want to be with anyone. I needed a break from emotional attachment. After Ty left me, I felt like I wouldn't trust anyone like that in a long time, so I was happy that I was comfy in a bed watching TV, freshly showered with money in my pocket. I had the best night's sleep, and I woke up to breakfast, and time to get up and get myself together. He got up early, went and got us breakfast and coffee. He ate with me and then left. He said, he will be back in a couple of hours. Take my time and do what I gotta do. So, I did just that while he was gone. I dyed my hair, styled my hair, man, the works. Not long after I was done and waiting for him, the door opens and a female walks in. She's pale and has a beautiful face, long, pretty blonde hair that was running down to her shoulders. She was really petite, way too skinny, and a size B chest. Pretty big blue eyes that had dark circles under them. It looked like she had been crying, and she was carrying a black trash bag that contained all of her possessions. Will walked in behind her and introduced her as Anna, and she needs some help too. He instructed me to get her together, get her pretty, and take some pictures and post them. He then told her to go on and take a shower, and then asked to talk to me outside. We went outside the door, and as I was shutting it, his voice got real stern and said, I see you have not made any money yet. And why the hell is that? I tried to explain that Sundays were the slowest days and I would be lucky to make any money today. Before I could finish, he cut me off and said, I don't give a fuck. You need to make some fucking money. What do you think this hotel pays for itself? I will pay for it tonight. But from now on, you pay half and half of all expenses. Now go make some fucking money. I couldn't even believe he was talking like this. I've never seen him so mad, and his voice scared the hell out of me. I looked at him when he cut me off, and I could see him get angry. His eyes got wide, and the white just disappeared, and they became all black. I was scared, but I did what he said. 
He then left me alone with her while he went out and got food and whatever else he did. When Anna got out of the shower and her skin was more exposed as she walked out of the bathroom in a small towel, I knew she was addicted to IV use. I assumed heroin. She confirmed it after I asked her if it was going to be a problem to not do drugs because that was his rule for me. Why wouldn't it be a rule for her or any other girls? After my kid's father passed away from an overdose, I didn't like to surround myself with girls I knew I could get close to, try to help, and something happened. So I cut all that out. And when she told me, I was like, okay, no girl. I'm sorry, you're going to have to make some calls because you cannot stay here. At that point, I didn't even care what the fuck Will had to say. I don't want her here, period. As soon as he came through the door, I stopped him and told him outside. I just told him I didn't think I would work with her that well. I didn't want to be around a heroin addict or any kind of addict at that matter. He did make her pack her bathroom and clothes up and took her home. I think he was trying to please me for some reason, looking back. Will and I then took a ride to Main Street, where all the girls walk and work. It was so weird. Remember how I said he knew everyone at the church? He knew all those girls, business owners, police officers, and other men who drove drug dealer cars. I don't know why I didn't just run then. I'll never know, I guess. About an hour or two of driving around talking to a bunch of different girls, this random ass girl jumps in the car. It was crazy. They had known each other for years, I guess, and she had been looking for me and wanted to make some money. She was quite a bit older than me, but still really pretty, like beautiful pretty. She had long, thick, curly, jet black hair. I didn't really get a good look at her until we got back to the hotel. Will told me he wanted to get a few girls together and make some big money. I was always going to be number one, and I will never post with another female because I am the number one. He told me I was important and we were building our own family. Amy was tall and thick, but she was gorgeous. Big blue eyes, pretty skin, a small waist with a big round butt, and she was a straight up bitch. She took benzos. She was prescribed to them, I guess, so he allowed it. It wasn't long before I couldn't help but watch her. She was popular, and then like at night, she would be falling out and nodding off. It drove me crazy. I think I even started a fight with Will about it once. I didn't think it was fair, honestly. Like, this bitch can get high, but I can't? Ha, huh, fuck you. What Will would do during the day, he would leave me at the hotel to make money, and he took Amy to the street and worked her. Well, it wasn't two days before they came home with another girl, a young one, 18. Her choice, no family. I only know what they tell me. Her name was Amanda. She was short like me and a little chunky, which was okay. Guys like chunky too. She had blonde, long hair and a cute smile. She was sweet and didn't say much. I tried to get to know her a little better, but she wasn't around for long. I posted her with Amy and she didn't get much of a feedback. More people were calling for Amy. Amanda stayed with us for a few days before she decided she wanted to go home. Will, Amy, and I didn't stay at that hotel for long. We ended up deep into the city, the furthest away from my hometown. Bigger room and a little nicer hotel with a view of the whole city. It had a shitty little microwave and a drive-up entrance to your room. Will and Amy brought home two girls that night. I don't remember them much because I wasn't involved with them much either. I posted them and the next few days we made money. Every time a girl would make some money, they would give it up to Will because he had them believe he was saving it for them and getting them anything they wanted. 
I continued to make money on my own, and I also gave him my money. I got conspicuous, and I will never forget the moment I knew I was not safe. I was outside smoking a cigarette. I wasn't out there long, but when I came back into the room, Will had all three girls posing on the bed as he was coaching them on how to pose and taking snaps of them. I didn't say a word and closed the door slowly. I don't know why I felt the way I did, but it just didn't feel right in there. I don't know if he heard me open and close the door, but I heard him yell my name and said he needed me. He handed me his phone and told me to post the pictures. When I got on the website and I tried to post the pictures, it now wanted money instead of posting ads for free. Will unhappily ran to whatever and put money on a card. When I tried to put the card in, it wouldn't accept it and said it wanted bitcoins. I informed Will and even showed him the page that it wasn't gonna post. He got furious and yelled at me. He turned and walked out of the room. I looked at everyone else and tried to apologize for his actions and to stay calm. It will be okay. He came right back in with a gun in his hand. I didn't even know he owned a gun. He hit me in the face with it and said I needed to find somewhere to post the ad, to do it quickly, or I will be done and he would kill me. That's when he left. I don't know if he realized he did that in front of three of the girls, and I don't know what, or I'm done, meant either. I was fucking terrified, and that's when I knew I had to find a way to escape. I learned real quick that I wasn't able to just leave any time I wanted anymore. After Amy got involved, Will changed. He started talking about taking us girls to New York and making bigger money and travel and go here and go there. And that alone scared the hell out of me. I wanted to build a life to get my kids back, not leave a state to trick and maybe get killed or abandoned. No, fuck that. I got fearful for my life when he hit me with that gun. I have been hit before, punched like a man, but I have never been hit with a gun. That night, I had a couple dates set up, and Will knew he had to take the girls and leave. I decided to try to make a plan to get away. The first date, I made 200 so I put 50 in my purse and then put 50 in a pocket in a bra hidden away, and I left the rest on the table. The second date, I made 150 I put half of it away and the rest of it on the table. Will came in the door not long after I was finished and grabbed the money off the table. My purse was sitting right there, and I didn't see him do it, but he took that money out of my purse and said he had to do something and left again. That was when I made my escape. I made a hundred calls before I finally reached someone who was willing to help me. He had a friend come and pick me up and bring me to his house. I will never forget the feeling I had when I was running out to the car with a trash bag full of my stuff I had collected in the past three weeks. I was scared to death that he would come pulling up and see me. That feeling didn't leave me until we hit the highway. I wanted to tell this story because I'd never have been able to get through telling it. I couldn't help to think where I would be if I stayed and if I would still be alive. So. To all of you girls out there, no matter what age, please be careful with whom you get involved with. Don't get stuck like I did. And to Will, I hope I never fucking see you again. If you are around and can remember, roll your mind's eye back to the weeks immediately following September 11th, 2001. Everything was America, particularly in the South and definitely in North Carolina, where I lived. There are a large number of military installations there, including a very large army base about an hour from my hometown. 
Nearly every car had, at minimum, an American flag bumper sticker, and a frightening majority of people thought anyone who had skin darker than a potato chip was a terrorist. Everyone was hypervigilant, and many people took this as an excuse to become overly interested in the lives of their neighbors, sometimes out of concern for their neighbor's safety, sometimes out of concern for their own. I was eight, and I was pretty sure my elementary school wasn't going to be the target of any massive terrorist attacks, and neither were my parents. So my brother and I continued to walk to school each day. This was never a problem. We walked to school every day that didn't have a totally awful weather for almost all of my grade school existence. My neighborhood even had weekly paved trails, including one that led directly to my elementary school that we always took. I can't remember if it was recent rain flooding the creek beside the trail or just the climate in general making the bugs come out in full force. But that week, my brother and I had decided to take a different route and walk along the road. This plan went off without a hitch until we were walking home one day in a big black SUV with tenant windows and giant American flags blocking the view of the back windshield and back seat slowed down to a crawl and then abruptly stopped in front of us and rolled down the window. The woman inside was blonde, maybe middle-aged, and wearing large sunglasses that obscured much of her face. It's not safe for you two to walk out here by yourselves, she called out to us. My brother responded with something to the effect of, it's fine, we always walk home. We don't live far. That was a mistake. She rolled up her window and drove a few feet away before screeching her tires to a halt and rapidly reversing back to us while rolling down her window. And she yelled, you spit on my car. I know you did. You spit on my car and you need to get in right now so that I can drive you home to your parents and you can apologize in front of them. I looked at my brother and we both shook our heads no. And I called back. I didn't spit on your car. Look at the side. And then she yells again. Get in my car right now so I can take you home. I turned to my brother again, and without a word, we took off running into the woods. My heart was thumping in my chest, and I never turned back, particularly after I heard her door open and close. We just kept running. We switched back and forth through the streets and woods, taking several different paths and finally ended up circling back around until we were home. We just sort of shrugged it off as, yeah, that was weird. Until maybe 15 years later when I told the story to a friend and their eyes grew wide. Dude, she was trying to kidnap you. That has always haunted me ever since. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true kidnap stories. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Nate Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Tammy Slayton, Luz Crispin, Colt Stone Wolf, Denny Sass, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank you all so much for your continued support. For without you, I would be nothing. And with all of that being said, if you are asleep, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.